Scotty Turnstone is a Harrisburg-based indie rock artist. His new single, I've Been to the Dungeon Before, is an epic, moody, but catchy piece of music that features guest vocals from Jessica Boyer and violin from Robin Chambers. Out now on all streaming platforms. Good morning, everybody. My name is Corey Ro- It's not morning anymore. It's afternoon. I was going to say. Doing? That's all right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Corey Rosen, and this is the Story Podcast. Today I have on a super awesome guest, Mr. Adam Yarger. Born and raised in Center Hall, PA, Adam started learning guitar in the seventh grade, later becoming interested in singing and songwriting in 10th grade. After graduation, Adam attended Penn State University for a summer and fall semester, but had no interest, so he decided to drop out and move to Nashville in 2014. Continuing to write and perform, Adam released his first EP in 2015, later taking to the road to promote his work. Soon, Adam got to write and record music at Sony Tree Studios, and more recently is working with Cantwell's Productions of Dolly Parton, Dolly Parton's guitarist. That's right. And to release his first album, Scratched Up Vinyl, in 2019, Adam made his CMA Fest debut on the Artist Spotlight stage. Adam is still on the road and playing out with his new band, Adam and the Armadillos. Adam continues to promote his latest releases, The Day I Got Arrested, and If I Know Her. Adam, how are you doing today? I am doing well. How are you? I'm doing awesome, man. You got, you, you've done a lot of stuff. I'm putting in the work, I feel like. <laughs> Definitely hitting the miles, too. So tell me about it. You uh, started playing guitar in seventh grade. Is that where your like, music first started, or uh, love for music, rather? Or uh, when did it start for you? I would say more so I was interested in learning more. I, I guess to go back further, in fourth grade, I actually was interested in playing saxophone. Oh, wow, really? And uh, yeah, I played saxophone for a little bit. And by a little bit, it was probably like, I don't know, half a school year or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, seventh grade rolled, roll, rolled along, and I really was into Nickelback as uh most seventh graders i feel like probably are maybe i don't know what the kids are listening to today but uh yeah no i was super into them i saw them live in uh state college and after that i was like oh i really want to learn how to play the guitar so i started learning after that and then yeah 10th grade came and at that point i was really into uh country music and like just the way that the songs were written and you know i love steel guitar and there's something about it that just touches my soul so I was super interested in writing country, and that's how this is all snowballed from there. So tell me, when did you start writing? Uh, I think I wrote my first song the summer after 10th grade, so probably like 2010, 2011, I think that was. And uh, what was the first song? I'm trying to think. I think the first song was Georgia Kiss. Georgia Kiss? Yeah, I put a little... Uh, I put a garage band project together i was like playing the drums on this little pad that i had bought from guitar center and uh i think i did the bass on that as well and it was super rough but i sent it to a couple of friends and like that's honestly kind of really good and so like getting that kind of positive feedback was really nice and i was thinking like well maybe like keep doing it may be able to get better and so uh that's how that kind of snowballed there and uh i would say i'm the best writer i've had like the biggest writer's block for like a couple years now and i feel like i've just been so busy with so many other things that it's kind of taken my focus from the creative side of writing but uh no i I love being able to put something together and piece together this story or a song and you know somebody can connect with that that's like the greatest feeling so at 10th grade do you start when do you start performing like actually like going out places so the first time i ever played out was a place in lock haven which is like 40 minutes from where i was from there really wasn't anywhere to play around where i'm from other than state college and there was no scene really for country music in state college and there's no real scene i feel like in lock haven for it either and i played this like coffee shop there on the main strip and uh, i'd brought some people out that you know knew me friends or whatever and uh I wouldn't say it was like super great my dad was even like you could do a little less talking while you're playing <laughs> apparently i was not very good at that aspect of it and uh but yeah no i think i did that once or twice and then i was kind of invested in school at that point and uh and then i was like this is definitely not for me so that's that's when the nashville thing all came about i was thinking how could i take this to the next level where is you know where are places that you can play 
and at that point i didn't even realize that you could make a living honestly like playing broadway or something like that and uh so yeah in the middle of college i was like yeah this isn't this isn't it summer fall semester i was done with all that so and so you moved to nashville uh how do you just pick up and move that's a that's a big decision, especially to go to a big city like Nashville. It's funny you brought that up. We were talking about that uh, just before we got in here, and uh, I was saying that I knew this girl from here. I don't know if she's from Harrisburg, but we both were in this Barbizon modeling and acting school. I did that in sixth grade. I was super into acting, like growing up. I loved like plays and stuff like that. So uh, we were in this class together, and she actually was living down there, and I think. I was going back and just kind of reaching out to people that were in the same class as me, just seeing how they were doing. And uh, she was like, I live down in Nashville. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'd love to come visit and just check out the town and just see what's kind of going on. And uh, so I went down with the girl that I was dating with at the time. And uh, we had a really good time. Like, I was like, oh wow, this is incredible. Like I saw lower Broadway and was just blown away. Like I'd never seen anything like that. And uh, so I was totally sold from that. And uh, yeah what was it i think that may then the may of 2014 i moved down there at 19 and uh that probably wasn't like the best decision i feel like because i was so young and like i couldn't get in to bars and stuff like that so there really wasn't much to do and uh so i just tried to write as much as i could and i was working at the boot stores uh on lower broadway so i was kind of consumed with that and they had a really strict like no musician policy type for like the workers there because they didn't want to deal with people always calling off or like just being mm -hmm. like a headache, I guess, essentially, which I, I totally understand that from a business aspect. Like, yeah, that's employees. what saying, actually. Yeah, no, it was crazy. We had blackout dates from September till or no, I'm sorry, from May till like September, October. You couldn't ask for time off because everybody was coming to Nashville and all, right, like it's when the season is yeah tourist season so uh yeah you have to be ready to work so i was doing that really for the first like two years living there and that's when i was like all right it's time to like really dive into music so i quit doing that and uh i was trying to network even harder and i was thinking well i'm in a good spot here why don't i just like go out and play bars all over and like build a fan base and then keep this as like a hub to record you know music to put out because at the time 2014 uh my instagram was really blowing up which is it's always wild because people ask me but oh my god you have 20,000 followers you must have i always you, you bought those followers right, you right, bought right. followers and it's like that's not even the case at all like i've just we're in like we're almost 10 years now like into instagram when you think about it we're one year away honestly from like 10 years i mean 2014 it would be this year nine years ago that you know Instagram was booming. People were giving people shout outs. I was on the the cute country boys page. That was right. a huge like help for my like following and stuff like that. And uh, but little did I know that they were like just following because they must have just thought I was cute or something like that because I put out my first EP and uh, I didn't I didn't market it well. I had no idea what I was doing at that point either. I was so green and such a in such a hurry, I guess, to give these people that were following me some kind of content you mm -hmm. know that they could have but uh yeah so it's been a it's been a wild ride so that's crazy so uh tell me about the process of your first ep what was that like so i actually one of my co-workers at the boot store her mom worked at hilltop studios which was kind of outside of town like north of nashville like 15 minutes and uh it's a nice little studio. It's out in the woods. It's kind of like this little house converted over into a studio. And uh, they had a super cool room, big board and like rock wall and stuff. like. It had a really cool vibe to it. And uh, I think it was Cindy, my coworker's mom. She worked there. And uh, yeah, I mean, I had a couple songs ready to go. And it was super cool because being so young and so new to the town i didn't know anybody obviously mm -hmm. and going in and working with those guys they have a pool of musicians to choose from and so you go in and you play like a little demo and they get like an idea of like your sound or what you're gonna you know really sound good with i guess and uh, they build like a band for you and uh yeah they bring everybody in we were gonna have uh, brent mason 
uh, play on my first DP, but he was down in Key West recording for George Strait. And I was like, who's that? Like, who's really? That? Like, <laughs> man, really? All right. Well, that's super cool. But uh, yeah, no. So like they bring in these guys and everybody you run through a couple takes and it's really awesome. I call it like Christmas Day, honestly, because you come in with this project, just acoustic, and you have this idea in your mind what it's going to sound like. And the guys hear a demo, they make their charts, you go in, all right, one, two, here we go. And all of a sudden, your song has now come to life in a matter of like seconds. And it's all before you. It was like the coolest feel. Like it, it gave me chills, like hearing the steel guitar on back road for the first time. I'll never forget it. It was super cool. So, like I said, it's like Christmas 2.0. So you got that all together. Was that uh, just a collection of songs for you, or did you have like a storyline for that? Uh, I just kind of had a couple songs that I thought were some of my best work. Uh, Back Road was probably the most favorite song, which I still have it out now. I took the EP down. I uh, kind of got self-conscious about it uh, later on, being that I feel like in this industry, you can see yourself grow, especially when you put something down on a track and you listen back and you're like, wow, I sound like I have no idea what I'm doing. Right. And, uh, so yeah, I got, I got kind of self-conscious about it. So I took it all down and, uh, people kept asking me, they hounded me about back road and I put out a music video for it. We shot this music video on my own. My sister, like help get the camera angle. Like she's the one holding it. And I got it all set up cause I used to do a little bit of photography, uh, in college before I uh, canned all that. And, uh, yeah, put this music video out and it just kept doing really well on YouTube. And I was like, oh, I think I might have screwed up from taking this video down or uh, the the streaming down. So I uh, ended up re-releasing it and people just it's just funny to see like, oh, they don't care how you sound or like they totally are not hearing the things that I'm hearing and yeah. they just love this song. And uh, yeah, so but yeah, that's how that kind of all. It's always funny how we get more in our heads about it than other people. Oh yeah, it, it's definitely strange because I'm always like, oh, super flat, and and people are like, no, oh, that's such a great song, man. Like, it's perfect, and I'm thinking, oh, perfect, far from it, but all, all right, right, I'll take it. So you dropped that EP. Uh, what's next then? Uh, after that, what was next? Still writing. Uh, the Sony Tree recording sessions were after that. Um, I was moving on from Hilltop. I was on the road at this point, kind of like learning about how all that works, like booking gigs for my stuff, uh, myself I actually was, uh, road dogging with a guy, Michael Danielson from Nashville. We were like buddying up and we were going out. We'd go to Florida. We went to Iowa. Uh, I'm trying to think of where else we were at Nebraska. That was wild. Never been out there. And we were playing Nebraska. I think we even, I don't know if we made a stop in Missouri somewhere, but that was just super cool being out in like the middle of the country, like playing music just felt so sick. And, uh, so yeah, the next thing was uh, Sony tree still writing, had some new songs I'd put together and, uh, I felt like I had grown a little bit. So I was ready to put out some more stuff and just see how it goes. I ended up recording three songs at Sony tree and, uh, I only ended up releasing two. I got super, bummed out i don't i don't know how to describe it i just i wasn't super thrilled with how the third one came out it was a slower song and uh i don't know i feel like i have a hard time with like the sappy songs like mm. the lovey dovey type of songs like as i'm older now and can like look back it's kind of funny to see that because now i'm all about like the super hardcore like cheating country songs <laughs> and like definitely not like oh here's roses yeah. yeah there's roses they're dead roses something like i don't know but uh yeah no i ended up not releasing that song it was it was called she's like whiskey it's not a bad song i was thinking recently like maybe i should like just release it because do it. yeah people want to hear it like people will probably love it um but i did that burn i released that song and uh find me fishing was also the third song that we did and uh I've kind of fell in the same cycle again of going back to being self-conscious about it. Mm -hmm. Left burn up because we did a video for that. I played uh, my hometown fair and we put this super cool music video together for it and uh, released burn as a YouTube song that way. And uh, same thing. Took it, took those songs down. Cause I was like, all right, 
I'm going to get together and I'm going to put a whole album together and it's not going to be anything like this. And we're just going to recreate the whole sound. And, uh, same thing. People love to find me fishing. We were talking about that this morning and, uh, the amount of streams that are on that song. I didn't know like promo for it. And it's like, wow, that's crazy to see that. Like, that's what that is off of no backing, no push. I mean, we did a video for it, music video. And, uh, it's on YouTube as well. But other than that, just organically, the numbers are pretty wild for nothing behind it. So, uh, yeah, I ended up bringing Find Me Fishing back. And uh, I actually have a different idea for Burn. I have mm. this bluegrass style for that song because the main riff that I originally wrote for it was super bluegrassy, meets like Eric Church, but like older Eric Church. And uh, so I took Burn down, but it's still on YouTube if like people want to hear like the original style of it. The reason why it sounds the way that it does is when we went in to record the musicians that were gathered for that session, we had, I can't remember what his name was, but he, he plays for uh, Bob Seger. So I was like, oh my God, Bob Seger is like super idle because I listened to a bunch right. of classic rock growing up with my dad. And so like, how am I going to tell that guy like, yeah, no, I don't like that riff. Please do <laughs> like what I'm doing here. Like this guy plays for Bob Seger. I am unsigned i am just this guy in town like i think he's he's got it under control but that's what he's done but yeah <laughs> no i uh I, I wish i low-key wish i would have put my foot down and just been like can you kind of do it more style like this and, and again as i'm older now and uh we went in after all those three songs uh i linked up with kent wells at that point and or after that and uh we put together 10 song album and it was really nice because having those two other sessions really got me ready for this mm. and i i guess you could say like i kept it real with kent like if i didn't like something you told him i would tell him yeah and like if he didn't like something he would tell me and we would find like an even we never butted heads it was super cool like he's such a great guy and uh super fun to work with so we never butted heads and like the moment he would hear the songs he was like oh i know exactly like this is who needs to play the keys for this song. And it just, that's good. yeah, no, it was super cool. And that experience was hands down. One of the coolest experiences uh, so far. So, so you can't put money on, on intelligence like that. Oh yeah. No, the, the guy is totally incredible. Like he knows his way around the guitar. He knows how to like put something together from nothing. Like I'm trying to think like, like I said about the keys, like he had this keyboard player. I was totally blown away. He was doing things on one of my songs and I was like, this couldn't be more perfect for like when I say like, oh, you hear the song in your head and then it comes to life. It really came to life working with Ken. So it was just a real honor for me to uh, have that experience. We have a few of those songs from that session. You want to talk about one of them? Uh, we have The Day I Got Arrested. So this is actually the first time working with Kent. The Day I Got Arrested wasn't created until after scratch that vinyl was released mm. i guess we i didn't really explain that too well when i sent that over but yeah the scratched up vinyl album came out and then it, it was just last year that i reached out to kent and was like hey let's do a couple more songs uh i have three again but the reason why i didn't release the third one yet is because this past june i got an email saying that uh artist from nevada cut it and released it because i wrote it with trent uh Willman from nashville and that guy is just an absolute beast of a writer he uh he works with cody johnson mm. and he's uh cody's producer right now and uh yeah so they sent me an email saying that jake jacobson cut it and released it on his ep one of those is the song and uh yeah so i was like well i guess i'll hold off for now and just let that do its thing and we'll sit on this and see what happens right so tell me about uh, the day i got arrested then so the day I got arrested, I wrote it actually right after we finished recording uh, Scratched Up Vinyl. And I was kind of bummed that I didn't get to like add it onto the project. It like just missed the cut. Uh, but this song came about. I was, uh, so I guess to tell the real story, I blew my back out in 2016 doing a deadlift at the gym. I slipped a disc in my L5 Ooh. and uh, my what was it l5 and s1 in between there that's the disc that was 
getting pushed out and it was touching my sciatic nerve. So my leg was super, super like numb and just awful tingly and uh, nothing was helping. And uh, I never, for the record, I was never really into like smoking pot or like really into that whole thing in high school. I guess you could say it was kind of like a goody two shoes. Uh, didn't party. I was always like in my room just trying to learn stuff for guitar. And uh, yeah, d- down in Nashville, my roommate was like, man, I know you're in a lot of pain, but like have this. you should try this. And uh, one night I was like, I- I'll try, man. I don't, I have nothing else to lose because it-, it was so bad. And uh, it was like instantaneously, like it took all that pain away. And uh, it was just like, it was actually honestly the most incredible feeling. And uh, so I kept doing that for the pain. And uh, yeah. I always say in a live show, I'm like, if anybody out there has ever dabbled, one of the side effects of uh, marijuana is uh, paranoia. Yeah. And uh, I was at my girlfriend's at the time and uh, just finished smoking out back. And I got super paranoid about the guy across the street because he was always outside like a retired like gym teacher or something like that. And he was always outside doing yard work or something. And, uh, you know, I was out back doing my thing, too. And like ash my bowl out and uh I thought, oh, man, I don't know. Like, I feel like he probably smelled that. Like, it reeks. So, obviously, like, how do you not smell that? And so, I went in, and I'm, like, looking out the door, like, looking out the window and trying to, like, see if he's out. And he's just out on his front porch just kind of sitting there. He must have just been enjoying the nice day. But he was just sitting there, and I got super paranoid that, like, he looks like he's waiting on the cops to show up. Like, oh, my God, did this guy call the cops on me for smoking? And, like, so I got super-duper paranoid, and I was like, why don't you just pick up your guitar and do something with it? Maybe that'll like calm you down. Maybe you can put something together right now. And uh, sure enough. Yeah. I wrote the day I got arrested in probably like 15 minutes and uh, didn't help my paranoia any, but uh, <laughs> got this super cool song out of it. So I was like, all right, well that'll work. We'll, we'll use that. So that's awesome. So it's not even about you getting arrested at all. It's- well, yeah, the, I guess if it's funny, I mean, I think it's kind of funny now, but it wasn't funny at the time. Uh, probably like, six to nine months later i was actually playing down here at the winter circle in grantville and i just played probably the worst show like the band was button heads we didn't end at the right time like we were supposed to play a whole nother like 30 minutes and uh my back was killing me like being in the boots and stuff like that i was in so much pain and uh, i think even like a patron came in and she was flipping out like screaming at us you're supposed to play till whatever and like just going nuts she even like followed us out into like the hallway and i'm heading out to the parking lot and i could hear her i think somebody was kind of like trying to like wrangle her down because she was like cussing and flipping out and i'm thinking gee whiz and so i got out of there and i went up to my car i'm just sitting in there like just trying to calm down and take away the pain and sure enough up pulls a squad car and i'm thinking oh my gosh like did somebody like follow me around or like what in the world is going on and like i had no clue i'm in the back parking lot too like why would they pull out there like that right so i got suit again i got super paranoid because i have other stories of like friends getting duis and situations that are like they were in their car and for whatever reason and uh so i was like well i'm not getting a dui so i ended up getting out of the car and uh sure enough the one officer came over and he's like what's going on and i was like (laughs) i don't know man like what do you what do you mean like what's going on like you tell me and he's like are you smoking and i was like what like why are you honestly here like what is going on and i was like uh yeah obviously like (laughs) i was so confused i was so lost like what what are you doing back here and uh yeah, the guy was like, we were just dropping off a lady. And I was like, why don't you drop her off in the front, like where the main door is and like there's lights and stuff. Like, why are you dropping her off back here? So that did not go down very well. And I got a ride down to Bass Pro behind there. Got fingerprinted and everything. So, uh, yeah, that was a foreshadowed story coming to life. So yeah. any writers out there listening, don't you be writing stuff about stuff that doesn't happen or didn't happen yet. Because there's always a chance it may happen. Well, that's it. This is the day I got arrested by Adam Yarger. Sat on his front porch when the blue 
The day I got arrested by Adam Yarger. So, but for those watching, by the way, feel free to post your or comment your questions that you have for Adam, and we'll get around to them eventually, if you have any at all. Yeah. So, you started working with uh, Kent Wells, and you got this ten-song album together, and then you started working on these other songs, and uh, that actually song made top one hundred. It did. Uh, it was the Country Pickens Top One Hundred of twenty twenty-two so how's that feel i was actually kind of pumped to see that honestly because uh like like i said earlier with doing everything honestly kind of in-house it is so hard to like tackle every single aspect of this industry with booking shows writing songs getting these songs recorded uh doing all the promo for the songs all the graphics uh music videos just there is so much in all of it and uh yeah where are we even going with this with uh yeah what what was the question Re- uh, refresh um, me sorry top 100 songs of 2022. that's right 2022 yes the promotion side of things uh yeah i mean i sent it to these guys it came out in october of 2022 so super late in the season right and uh for them to add that in there i thought it was super cool so shout out to uh country pickens uh, for the love on the day I got arrested. They've added it to their up and comers playlist on their Spotify. So that's super cool to see that. Uh, and it's super cool, like doing the backside of all of the like business side of things. Like I run the Spotify for artist app and I can see like where people listen, the playlist that it gets added into iTunes shows you uh, who's like shazamming the song. Like mm. what song is this? It shows up there. Uh, apparently that song so far has been Shazam 10 times in its lifetime. So it's super cool to see that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, super big shout out to Country Pickens for uh, all that love. So you you did all that, and we're kind of backtracking a little bit. You made your CMA Fest debut. Yeah, 2019. Tell me about that. How did that process begin? Uh, that was super wild because I was still living in town at the time, and uh, my friend Candice... Uh, she actually got that all hooked up she met me we were i think we met downtown through my old roommate tyler and uh yeah we became friends and she was hosting writers rounds and doing uh more so of like the music business side of things so she had an in that way with some of the people with cma fest she knows a ton of people so it's super nice to have her in your back pocket and uh yeah she's actually the one that was helping me like reach out to some of the cma people i think she actually submitted me to that and uh yeah they came back and they were like congratulations you've been selected to play the spotlight stage and uh 
CMA Fan Fest. Uh, I forget what they call the uh, the big expo. It's like a if you have a pass to the stadium, you can get in there, or you have to like pay whatever amounts to get a ticket. But uh, yeah, no, that was super cool. Got to uh, go in where all the other artists do. I got to see Blanco Brown. I passed him on my way out. It was super cool. And uh, it was super fun. I made a bunch of fans that day. Uh, a guy from Colorado, Ken Nichols, if he's listening out there, he uh, I met him that day and we stay in touch. Actually, the one time that we went out to Denver, I actually linked up at his house and like had some drinks with him. Super nice guy. And uh, so it was a super cool experience. And uh, yeah, CMA Fest 2019. So and then uh, that was the the lovely year before everything happened. Yeah, no, I was really gearing up for like this super cool release. Like, oh, I played CMA Fest, and now I'm releasing this album. And uh, I think it was I was going to release that on. I want to say it was Friday the 13th. I was going to release That's it the exact day. But yeah, it was in March. It was that weekend. Uh, everything shut down, and I was like, well, this couldn't be worse timing. So. I'm still trying to figure out how to like go back and be like, Hey, by the way, if you missed this and the whole thing that happened storm of that, here you go. Here's a whole album of songs, but yeah. So kind of got derailed there because I was actually, I was supposed to go down to Florida. Like I set up this whole big tour, essentially acoustic tour. I got all these CDs printed out and uh, made them through like CD baby or whatever. And, uh, yeah, I was going to go out and really road dog it and push this album. And, uh, yeah, everything got shut down. So, yeah, might have to revisit that at was, some point. I was saying, everything shut down. What are you doing to get back out, to get back on it? Uh, yeah, just uh, what I did was just recorded new music. I was like, mm -hmm. I got the day I got arrested. If I know her, uh, one of those I was actually sitting on that for a long time i wrote that in 2014 with trent wilman and uh yeah i actually that song was on hold with blake shelton for a little while and then i heard nothing on that so they apparently didn't decide to go with it unfortunately big crying face because that would have been super cool that would have been really cool uh yeah so uh yeah moving on from that i just kind of sat on it uh trent was working with a artist out of texas six sanchez he actually ended up doing a version of it for his, I think it was an album. They put it on his album. And then uh, just more recently, it was like a couple of months after recording it, I got an email saying that Jake Jacobson uh, put it on his EP. And I don't know if it's going to be on his album or what the deal is there. But uh, yeah, they released it. And I was like, oh, all right, well, I'll sit on it again and just give it a little time. Wait for the right time, I guess. So we have it here. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Like, what is it about? I send you one of those. Yeah. If, if I know her. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, sorry. If I know her. Uh, yeah, this was, uh, I wrote this, uh, 2016. Uh, this was amongst a breakup in 2016. I was getting ready to play my hometown fair, the Grange fair. And, uh, I was on my way back to Nashville to rehearse with the band for that show and my dad was driving i was at that time that's like immediately after i had the accident at the gym with my back and so dad was driving and i was in the back of the suburban kind of like laying down <laughs> just trying to be like comfortable for this like 12 hour drive and uh yeah on the way down i kind of crafted this song and when i got down there we got finally back to my place uh yeah, we like went into this pretty much empty apartment, which was kind of like shocking because, again, I was in the middle of this breakup and uh, I was sitting there thinking like, well, I'll try to finish that song because it was pretty good and see if you can figure it out because it's really only kind of stuck on like a chorus for that song. There was a line in the chorus that I couldn't find and uh, I'm sitting there looking out the window just trying to think about it and it started raining like super, super hard and uh I was like, well, there you go. You could say something about it raining. And uh, yeah, hit you like a storm, leave you standing in the rain. And so there was that song. And uh, yeah, I, I sat on this forever too. I played it that week at the fair and I got really good reviews on it. And people were just like, I really like that song. And I was like, oh yeah, great, wonderful. And uh, at that time I wasn't like ready to record new stuff. And then the whole album thing got in the way. And uh, at that time I was, kind of looking to write new material and just kind of see what I could come up with. 
And uh, yeah, just recently, since I've been in like such a writer's block, I was like, why don't you just release some of this older stuff, mm-hmm. you know, pass the time and uh, just see what people think. And so, uh, yeah, went back, got a hold of Kent and did the three songs. And uh, yeah, if I know her was born. And let's give it a listen. I know her She's probably somewhere on the water With the sunshine shining on her Like the Amarillo sun If I know her She's got the radio up loud Singing with those windows down Hitting every key just right Is that girl Stars fall from the sky like she does so easily. Cause that girl there is a wild one. You never keep her down, she's born to run. She'll hit you like a storm and leave you standing in the rain. She won't feel. Probably moved on by now And she ditched this one horse town And chasing down her dreams Cause that girl there is a wild one You'll never keep her down She's born to run She'll hit you like a stone her mind and I know she's doing just fine she don't love me anymore and that was if I know her tell me you been doing a situation over here that's okay you got it I think so there we there go, we go. <laughs> yeah these headphones are, are uh, they move in all sorts of ways yeah so You've been a uh, solo acoustic. You've had a band for a little, a little bit, but nothing quite serious. Uh, tell me about the Armadillos. Yeah, Adam and the Armadillos. We, uh, we've we been playing for the past almost a whole year. Our first gig was in April last year. We played a adult Easter egg hunt in the middle of the day because <laughs> at that time, that's the only kind of gig we could get between my solo acoustic show schedule and these guys uh, were actually playing in like a rock band, like a punk rock band at the time so like trying to find like a night where we could book a gig on a saturday or friday night it was like completely impossible and uh so we're like let's play this easter egg hunt and just see how it goes didn't even play like a full drum set like it was a cajon acoustic guitar and i think an electric guitar and uh, i was like wow this is like really good like we all really played well together the energy was all really good so i was like all right well that was awesome so we Got together then after that, and we did. Uh, I think we were messing with a cover, a Co Wetzel cover, and uh, 
we all said it was good, but we weren't like thrilled enough to put it out yet. So we messed with a couple other things. And uh, at that time, the guitar player, Alex, Alex Sturbenz, he, uh, he got a, I think he got a call or something about coming and playing open mic to maybe play at like the first downtown, you know, as like a residency type thing. And uh, yeah, so we went and played this open mic night on a Monday and they were like, all right, well, we like you guys. We want to, we want to have you on Mondays from 12 AM to 2 AM. And I was not shocked or thrilled, I guess is the better term for that at all. And uh, we played syllabus week and it was literally insane. And we were like, well, that was only because it was syllabus week and like, you know, people could come out cause you know, there's nothing going on or whatever. And uh, yeah, then it was like another week went by and it was still the same amount of kids. And we're like, all right, this is kind of wild. I thought syllabus week was over. Like what are these kids doing out here? And I think we did that for like two or three more weeks. And at that point it was like, Oh wow, this is kind of insane. The amount of people that are coming out on Mondays from like 12 AM to two to see some country music. Because, again, like going way back to the beginning, I was thinking at the time, like, there's no market or there seemed to be no market at that time for like country live country music and state college. So it was really kind of mind blowing to me. And uh, yeah, so that was going so well that at this point now we are now 1030 to 2 a.m. on Monday nights. And uh, yeah, it's just super awesome. Uh, We love all the support from the students and like everybody that's been coming out just been super fun and uh yeah we're super honored to have like such such a great support from everybody so you have this now what's in the future for you guys uh so our goal is to uh, keep playing we actually honestly have a really full schedule for this summer we uh we're now at the point where we're like double booking days oh, wow. and like yeah it's, it's super it's super cool to see but uh, at the same time it's like oh my gosh my voice better be like super ready for like double days and then like oh four more days after that like constant singing right. uh so we got a super full schedule this summer that you can check out it's on our spot or yeah, our spotify <laughs> our facebook uh we don't have a website so we do everything through facebook and instagram we post graphics on there of show dates and stuff like that so all of that is on there uh we'd like to get some original content uh or original songs recorded and put out uh that's probably like one of our higher up goals at this time. So I got to get out of the writer's block and shake it off and uh, get back to putting pen to paper and uh, making something happen. So uh, we can put a little armadillos project out. And so if you guys want to know where all of that's at, he does have a link tree in the description. And uh, so be sure to check that out and you can find everywhere that he's at. Yeah, absolutely. We're kind of running out our time here. So I like to have the, I have all these questions that I like to ask all my guests. So that's what we're going to get around to now. If you have a question for Adam, please be sure to comment that and we'll get around to that as well. So out of all of these years and of all of these experiences, what has been one of the most memorable experiences for you? Uh, All right. I'll give you like a top three. Um, I think CMA Fest is definitely on there. That was super fun. Uh, and it was super cool to like see your name on like some of the CMA graphics that were coming out and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So that was super fun. Uh, I really enjoyed working with Ken. And I also like, I guess I would lump this in. So it's kind of like four experiences. Uh, I also appreciate the early road years of like going. I mean, I'm still doing it. We just got our first van, uh, which is getting <laughs> finished up at the shop. Uh, it had some minor things that needed uh, polished out. But uh, yeah, just uh, going from like riding with a guy and you're going all the way out to Nebraska, you you just learn so much doing that kind of stuff. So I guess I appreciate that uh, experience uh, from a learning aspect. Um, But I guess an experience from like performance and stuff like that uh, would just be most recently playing Thon at Mm -hmm. uh, the Bryce Jordan Center with the Armadillos because uh, I was... I've been telling everybody it's cool to like see a bunch of shows there, see Nickelback there in seventh grade and be totally inspired. And now it's like full circle. I'm not like, we're not essentially playing the Jordan center as the armadillos, but we're playing that venue 
and for a really super awesome cause. It's for the kids, and mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't get any better than that. So, uh, yeah, to be able to, like, come back and play there. And then to have the show and experience that we did, because not only was it super cool to be in the arena and you're playing, you know, you're you're the show, like you're the entertainment. Uh, not only was that cool, but the response from people, they had a live blog where people were essentially tweeting during it. And it was there was one that stuck out to us that was 415. The threat of country hour is in the air. And then it. 5 15 it must have been the same person they were like i was a completely different person at 4 15 <laughs> that was amazing like it, it was super cool to see that and then we were told that we were the first band in thon history to get an encore because really? i think it's a tightly ran schedule with everything i mean they have a ton of bands that come through there it's a 70 some hour dance marathon i mean they got bands every hour or so uh yeah, we finished our last song and uh, some of our friends from the uh, cross country team that were super big are super big supporters of us. Uh, they started the one more song chant and then the whole Jordan Center joined in. And uh, it, that was honestly like super incredible to uh, experience that. So that's probably going to be a lifelong memory there. That's awesome. Yeah, it was super cool. On the almost flip side of that, what is one of the worst or funniest experiences you ever had during a show uh worst experience would be getting arrested after the show that was oh, yeah. already horrible <laughs> like if you could just like light a can of crap on fire that would be that um another experience that was kind of tough for me was when we were putting together scratched up vinyl kent was super into the project to the point where he was reaching out to uh, some industry people and he's good friends with Eric from uh, Broken, or not Broken Bow, uh, Black Door, or, uh, oh my gosh, Black River, that's who it is. Black River Entertainment, which is Kelsey Ballerini, Jordan Davis is on there. I'm trying to think of who else. Those were the two, like, big dogs uh, at that time. And uh, so he was friends with Eric, and I think it was, like, halfway through uh, Scratch the Vinyl, or actually, I'm sorry, we put a EP together with Kent and then it turned into let's do a couple more songs and make it an album. Mm. So yeah, in between that time frame of EP and album working with Kent, uh, we met with Eric and uh it was kind of like a hey, like an artist pitch, like you should work with this guy, like you know, check him right, out. Right. And uh so we got together with him in the studio and we're flipping through some of the songs and uh was not really interested from what it seemed like in any of it and then at the last song he was he kind of chirped up at i learned it from hank and he was like oh what's that and uh kind of caught an ear for it and then uh kind of like you could t see the energy kind of like die back down and it was like oh he's not interested at all like you could tell too and then like weeks after i kept like asking ken hey you, you, did you hear anything from eric or anything like any follow no, he's super busy, and it's like, oh man. And then you get the point after a while. So that on it, I kind of tuck that away, and I don't like to think about that because that puts me in like a, a negative headspace that I don't have time to focus on that. Right, of course. You know, it, it just puts you in a bad spot. So yeah, I like to not think about that. But that would probably be a really tough, terrible experience to feel like. You always hear about people. Oh, they tell you no. They tell they sure do tell you no. Like. And you'll feel it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'll they'll be really, really, really nice about it. But they'll tell you no. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's amazing. So what is one thing that you know now that you wish you had known when you first started? Um, Don't believe everybody. Like, even, like, your followers and stuff like that. Like, it's so hard to gauge all that stuff. There's, I feel like there's a lot of smoke and mirrors that a lot of people don't see and uh like the behind the scenes stuff like even like talking to some people like one of the things that i didn't even really know till like i dove into the music world was like george Strait didn't write any of those songs it's always somebody like i didn't know i didn't know that at all really i mean honestly until like i moved to nashville and like was seeing like oh that guy wrote that song like i didn't know that and uh so yeah i guess like looking back just keep uh your head down i guess i don't know I, I, I don't know the there's so many experiences and uh 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't know. Just can't believe everybody. Cause everybody's got a friend or whatever. And I don't know. Well, I mean, you're right. Gotta be careful who you trust, who you uh, take words from. Yeah. Every, everybody's doing the same thing, yeah. honestly. And uh, I think people get hung up on like, Oh, well you're making it now. Like, doesn't this happen or doesn't this happen? It's like, well, you can ask anybody that question and it's more so of like how they are going to gauge themselves. I, I I feel like if you would ask somebody that is on the radio or is signed or something like that, if you ask them, are you making it? Their answer would probably be like, no, I'm not making it. I'm signed. Like these, there's these other things that are attached to it. But I think deep down, they'd probably be like, well, technically uh i mean technically yes i, I don't know also. i'm not in that spot i'm just seeing it from an outside view but yeah it's, it's a wild world it is a wild world and the music industry is uh, uh not always been the nicest and it's still not oh, always it's cutthroat and, yeah. and i think that's just the nature of the beast honestly yeah. and, and you're not going to please everybody like no you're not that guy didn't like us but i don't know penn state seems to dig what we're doing so you know you got to take stuff with a grain of salt and you know, if you enjoy doing it, you just got to keep rolling with it. So where can people find you out now? You have a few shows coming up. Uh, I'm trying to think. Our next show, I have a couple acoustic things coming up. Our next band show is actually, we have a, I'm trying to figure out the best words to describe this. This gig is not opening for Kenny Chesney, but it's the night of Kenny Chesney's show in State College, and we are playing to the VIP ticket holders who have like early entry into the venue, and I don't know what other accommodations that the uh, Kenny tour is giving out with those VIP tickets. But that is our next full band show. Uh, I take that back. Looking at my calendar, we are playing the first on St. Patrick's Day from 11 to 1 p.m. So 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We have the Kenny show. Uh, we're back at Winter Circle in May. We take a trip to South Carolina, North Carolina, West Virginia. That's going to be in a weekend in April. So we are really all over the place. Uh, the best place would be to follow the Facebook or Instagram to keep up with all of that. Yes, but be sure to keep up with all of them before they head out onto their next tour. Yeah, let your friends and family know. There was somebody in a, at campus. They were like, I'm going to tell my dad he lives in North Carolina. I told him that you got to go see these guys. They're awesome. So I, they apparently he's going to come out. They marked it on the calendar. They said, "Well, with all that said, my name is Corey Rose, and this has been the Story Podcast. If you want to check out more of what we do, go ahead and go to CoryRoseandProductions.com. That's C O R Y R O S E N Productions.com, where you can find out more about me, the projects I do, and this podcast. Tomorrow we have on Big Mama Music. She is a impersonator." uh cover musician so she gets dresses from like the 50s 60s 70s or oh, whatever I'd love to see that oh yeah and she gets them all together and she puts on a show of uh you know a disco show or a rock and roll show or whatever i want to see the uh the outfit changes i want to i'm curious where she gets them from like the time like in between the sets i want to see that so i'm excited yeah i'm excited to go in uh the great t detail of that Monday, we have Kevin Whitaker. He is a, an amazing musician from around here. He's doing all sorts of cool stuff with his new music. Uh, the 14th, we have Dan Mayer. He's a great guy um, from around the area involved in the theater industry, so I'm really excited to dive deep into theater with them. And Friday, we also have another theater guy, Dustin DeBlanc, is coming in to share his story and everything that he's got going on there. And with all that said... I hope you guys have a wonderful first day. If you like this episode, please be sure to like, subscribe, follow, share with all your friends, and we will see you next time. Bye.